Thomas Eggleston, United States Army, Vietnam. Tom is one of my Vietnam helicopter pilots, Huey helicopter pilots. He was a ROTC graduate and uh, found himself in Vietnam in his early 20s. He went to flight school training in Fort Walters, Texas for four months and then over to Fort Rucker, Alabama for two months learning to fly the Huey helicopter and uh, just got into the thick of it over in Vietnam, folks. He initially was with the 90th uh, Combat Replacement Group or unit and then he ended up with the 160th Combat Aviation Group and flew with an Air Cavalry unit over in Vietnam and saw a lot of action. And one of my unsung heroes, Tom Story, he's just been here in my archives for many years and uh, I'm just happy to be able to share it with you today. I interviewed Tom in Florida. It was uh, Sunrise, Florida. It was in February of 2007. I met Tom and um, I know he's still around doing well today and hopefully he'll come on the Huey helicopter flight with me when I do that near Fort Rucker, Alabama, hopefully in September. Um, if anybody else wants to come along, let me know, okay? Uh, it's limited, but uh, it's going to be a great experience. I'll get to fly uh, right in a Huey helicopter, so I'm looking forward to that. I need to thank Carl Sims. Carl stepped forward and wanted to sponsor a story, told me to pick a Vietnam story. So Carl, here's the story I picked, Tom Eggleston's story as a Vietnam helicopter pilot. And I want to thank you, Carl, for your dedication to our country, our veterans, and for helping support my work and helping others to learn about Vietnam. I, I appreciate you. Thank you. God bless you. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story like Carl, there's information in the video description below the video. All of my videos are there in the, uh, in the video description. And on my website, if you go to LarryCapetto.com, click on ding, sponsor a vet. You'll see pictures of my veterans, some of them, not all of them. And uh, you can include their name in a sponsorship and I'll do the rest. If you'd like to donate to my work, there's information always in the comment section at the top of the comments of every video. So. Some of you have stepped forward. Thank you. God bless you. You're supporting my radio station too. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Voices of History Radio. You can get the free app on the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store and download it. Have it on your phone. Everywhere you go, you can just have living history in the palm of your hands. A lot of you said these stories are soothing. They're healing. They're therapeutic. And I agree with that. There's a, there's a calming sense that comes, especially if you're going through a hard time. Listen to one of these stories. Listen to Larry Chelsea's story about being a, a prisoner of war for seven years in Vietnam. Listen to Marty Weiss, Holocaust survivor. Listen to some of these combat stories. It'll help you change your perspective of life. So there's so much benefit into this living history in the palm of your hand. So I invite you to listen to K KVOH, Voices of History Radio. Folks, that's it for now. God bless you. Thank you for watching, listening, sharing these videos. I will talk to you again soon. Lots of things coming up. A lot of stories that need to be told and uh, I'm getting ready to go out and start interviewing more veterans hopefully this fall and uh, th I thank my God for all of it. I'm serving him and my country through the lens of my camera. Amen. God bless you. Vietnam. What year did you go over there? I got there February of 1970, stayed exactly one year, left February of 1971. And tell me again, you were a helicopter pilot? I flew Hueys. Okay. Um, down, I was in what was called Four Corps, which was the southern part of Vietnam, down in the Delta. I flew for an air cavalry unit, and uh, we worked mainly with the Vietnamese. Uh, the few Americans that were down there were special forces. And advisors. Okay. That was the start of Nixon's 
Vietnamization program. That's he started in in the Delta area of Vietnam. Okay. So how old were you when you went to Nam? Help me with the math here. I was twenty three when I went over. Did you enlist? I was an ROTC graduate out of college, so I guess you could say I volunteered. So, well, okay, so at that time, um, what, were, what was the mood of the, those around you, your peers, the country, towards Vietnam, and, and did you know that you might someday be in Vietnam? When I went to college, um, first of all, it was, a, it was a military college, a private military college, Norwich University. Um, that was 1964 when I went there, and Vietnam was not even a blip on people's consciousness. Um, but you had, by going to that school, you did have a military commitment um, just from going to that school. It was mandatory four years of ROTC. Graduating from college, you spent either two years active duty, and this is in 1964, or six months active duty in the reserves for training and then a seven-year commitment in the reserves afterwards. Um, Naturally, that all changed as Vietnam blossomed and it became an active duty commitment. They needed so many officers. So I guess you could say it was voluntary. The mood, naturally, in the college I went to, uh, for the most part, was supportive. Um, the majority of my classmates did go in the military. A few got exemptions either for physical reasons or family reasons. Um, the mood in the country, you could see change. Um, in the mid-60s, as the build-up started, it was very supportive. Um, and then you started, like you have now, you started getting um, people protesting. Um, there was a lot of upheaval in society back then, in general. Um, civil rights movement was very big. Um, and that, I think some of the anti-war or people grew out of the civil rights movement where they questioned and they protested um, the norm. And it became divisive. Um, and as has been documented, the Tet Offensive in 68 um, turned a lot of people off because they believed what they saw in the news, that it was a, a communist victory and what are we doing there? Uh, facts later on prove that it wasn't a victory for the communists, that uh, they did in fact lose a great deal. Propaganda-wise, it was a major victory. And it was a after that you could see the country turning in its uh, feelings toward the, the military and the veterans. And um, it just it got less and less supportive as it went along. Yeah, very, very unfortunate that happened, and uh, that you, you explained it very well. Thank you. That was good. Um, so now you find yourself going to Vietnam. Um, tell me the first thing you remember about getting in country, if you got off a plane, the smell, the sights, the sounds. What did you experience? Uh, getting off the plane, it was the, the heat and humidity, the smell. Um, there was a peculiar smell when you first got in country. I flew into Tonsonu outside of Saigon. Um, we got there probably um, late morning, early afternoon, I forget the exact time of day, but I remember the sun was beating down on the, on the runway, on the tarmac. Um, and it was a mixture of the tropical smell, um, jet fuel because the Air Force was right there at Tonsonut. Um just a combination of whatever. Um, that was in February, which in the Delta is the dry season. That's when the farmers burn their rice paddies, which is a horrendous smell when you first smell it. Um, between the rice burning, the fertilizer that they use, which was basically manure, um, all they would just set the rice paddies on fire and burn them off, kind of like sometimes you see out here in the Everglades with the sugarcane fields. Um, plus, as we got off the plane, the people going home were standing there waiting to get on the plane to leave. And naturally, uh, there was a lot of harassment, a lot of calls being made out to the new people coming off the plane, and you had no idea what you were getting into. As much as you may f 
have felt you were prepared for it. It was something totally foreign to anything probably most of us had ever experienced. And it was just the unknown. Um, you know, 20 hours earlier you were in the United States. Uh, you get on a plane and you get off and, you know, it's, it's a whole new world and you're, you're apprehensive, you're nervous, you're scared. And uh, it, it just all comes down on top of you when you walk down those steps. So tell me, you get to Vietnam, are you assigned to an aviation um, uh, squad or what, what happens? We went to what was called the 90th Replacement Company, which was at Binh Hoa Army Base. And uh, there they assigned you, you filled out a sheet re uh, requesting assignment if you wanted to, to whatever unit. Um, I had a very close friend that had preceded me to Vietnam. And I knew exactly where he was, and of course, that's what I put down. I figured if I'm going to be there, I might as well be with somebody I know. Um, the Army, true to its um, calling, sent me the complete opposite direction. Um, but we spent, I spent a couple days at the 90th replacement. Um, I was assigned to the 160th Combat Aviation Group, which was the overall headquarters for the Delta for four core. And I got a flight down to Canto, which was in kind of in the center of the Delta. That's where the headquarters was for 164th. They in turn assigned me after a day or so, I think I spent two days there, they assigned me to uh, an Air Cavalry Squadron um, in a provincial capital called Vinh Long, which is about a 15 minute flight north of Canto. Um, when I got to the squadron, they had the three air troops that were part of their squadron, plus they had an attached air troop. Um, I got assigned to the attached air troop and uh, spent most of my year with that unit. So what type of combat did you get into? Um, you were working with the South Vietnamese? South Vietnamese. Um, so are you taking them into landing zones? Are you uh, going on combat assaults? Uh, what are you doing? We, we did everything with them. Like It was an caval air cavalry unit. Um, we sent out a what we used to call a package. We sent out a package every day of 13 aircraft. We sent out four scout aircraft, four Cobra gunships, four Huey troop ships, and one Huey, the fifth Huey, was the command and control helicopter. Um, and we were assigned to work with a Vietnamese unit each day. And depending on what that unit was doing, determine what we would do that day. It could be a combat assault. It could be uh, medevac. Uh, it could be flying supplies around. It could be ferrying troops from point A to point B. Um, it all depended on the kind of unit we were assigned to, what was going on in that area that day, um, what the commander wanted to do. Um, true to the cavalry mission, going back to the days when it was a horse cavalry, the scouts would go out. We would send two scouts and two gunships out with the command and control helicopter, uh, and they would look for things. Um, the Vietnamese commander would say he wanted to check out um, a village, um, a, uh, a wooded area, go along a river, go through uh, um, a flooded area, depending on where we were and the time of year. And they would look for things. And um, they would find them. They would find people hiding in bunkers. They would find um, people infiltrating into South Vietnam. Um, and sometimes the scouts and the gunships would take care of it. Sometimes we would insert Vietnamese troops. It could be regular army troops. It could be um, their version of the National Guard, which is a, the regional force, popular force is what they were called. Their nicknames were the Rough Puffs from the abbreviation. Um, we worked with some SEAL units. That was a mix of American and Navy SEALs. Um, it was just a wide variety of missions that we, we did. Um, we did, like I said, we did do medevacs, even though we weren't medevac equipped. 
It was basically picking up somebody and flying them to the nearest medical facility uh, to be treated. Uh, South Vietnamese or Americans? Both. Yeah. Both. The, uh, most of them were South Vietnamese. Um, we did get some Americans. Um, the Navy had their brown water boats down in the Delta because of all the waterways that were down there. Um, we evacuated a few of them. Um, they were the advisors, they were the special forces. If they needed to be evacuated, if we were there, we would do the evacuation. Were the South Vietnamese, uh, were they called the Arvins? The regular troops of the Arvins, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. Um, the Delta, or Four Corps, is it, the Delta is the general name, Four Corps is what the Army called it, was broken into four military areas. Um, there were three Arvin divisions. Each division had a specific geographic part of the delta they were responsible for. The fourth area, um, which was very large and um, part of it bordered Cambodia, was what they called the 44th Special Tactical Zone. And that was all, <clears throat> excuse me, all um, rough puffs with advisors or uh, special forces troops advising them. And uh, there were no Arvin troops there. It was just the regional force, popular force troops. When you were training, I don't know if you went to Fort Rutgers or where you did your training at, uh, in Texas or Alabama or... We started in Texas. We Fort did... Fort Walters? Fort sir. Walters, Texas. When you're going through your training, Tom, are you... Is there a point where you go, this is cool, man. I, you know, this is all right. I'm, I'm somebody and I'm going to go to Vietnam and I'm invincible. I mean, do you ever feel like that? You start when you when you start of getting the the mechanics down of flying, and you realize you weren't going to kill yourself when the instructor stepped out of the aircraft. You felt good because of the accomplishment. Um, as you went along in your training, it became a little more serious in that you knew where you were going to be in six months, three months, whatever the case may be. Um, the, th the feeling of invincibility, I think, is part of being young, which is why the military likes young people. Um, you do things when you're young um, that 20 years later, if you were confronted with the same situation, you might think about it before doing it. But you just react it. Um, during flight school, like I said, we started Fort Walters. We spent four months there uh, just learning the basics of flying. Um, my class... The first two months was a civilian instructor. The second two months, or the second phase, was a military instructor who was a Vietnam veteran and would tell you things of what to expect. They then split our class. Some went to Hunter Stewart in Georgia, outside Savannah. The other half of us went to Fort Rucker in uh, Alabama. And there again, my first instructor was a civilian. Um, and then after that, it was all military pilots, um, all Vietnam veterans. And once you got into the transition into the Huey, which was um, after you'd been there for approximately two months, the first two months of Fort Rucker was instrument flying, then you transitioned into the Huey, then you started hearing, this is what you need to do, this is what you got to expect from your instructor. So was it like a mini basic training in the sense that they're giving you tactical situations of, of what could happen, the, the worst case scenarios, you know, your, 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 uh, your helicopter is shot, I mean, you're not a hot LZ, are they giving you all this stuff? You get that in the, la the last phase of training was the tactics phase. And in fact, the last two weeks you were out in the, living out in the field. Um, first for five days, he came back in for the weekend, he went back out for a few more days. Um, and there they were trying to teach you um, what you needed to know. Um, a, a man I served with in the National Guard in New Jersey years later, we were talking about the difference in the pilots that uh, learned to fly during Vietnam and the pilots that were going through flight school in the 1980s and coming into the National Guard. And he said, when you got out of flight school, that was the most technically proficient you ever flew. 
And it's true because the instructors were on top of you constantly to do things by the book. Um, and you, you didn't stretch yourself too much. Um, when you got to Vietnam, they taught you how to fly. And that was what the um, old guys, I guess I'll call them, when I got to my unit, that's what they told me. They were going to teach me how to fly. And they did. Um, I did things with the helicopter I never knew the helicopter could do. Um, and as I became an old guy, I tried to impart that to the new people coming in. He said that, uh, this man in the National Guard said, we got out of flight school, we went to Vietnam for a year and got our PhD in flying. The people coming out in the 80s, um, they get out of flight school, they go into National Guard and they get to fly once or twice a week for a couple hours here and there. They don't get that daily repetition of six, eight, ten hours a day. So they, they can't develop as quickly as we did because they don't have the, the time, they don't have the ability to do it because the National Guard didn't provide that. Um, you give me a, a, a unique perspective of the training and then actually getting into combat. I'm sure a lot of things you learn on the job, obviously. They can't, yes. Do you, know. you think you were properly trained for the things you encountered in Vietnam? Technically, yes. I mean, I, I knew how to fly the aircraft. I knew the limitations of the aircraft. I knew my limitations coming out of flight school. Um, I knew the basics of what was expected of me. Um, every unit flew slightly different tactics. Um, I had the um, good fortune when I first got to my unit that most of the aircraft commanders had been flying together for months and they knew each other as well as you can get to know anybody. And they knew what to anticipate that the other person was going to do before they did it just from the situation because they've flown together so much. So I learned from some very, very good pilots what to do and what not to do. Um, and that helped me tremendously developing my skills as a pilot. Were you an aircraft commander? After about four months I became one, yes. So is that considered a chief warrant officer? Is that what they called you? Or? No, I was, actually I was a commission officer. When I went to Vietnam I was a first lieutenant. Okay, because I, what, what is the chief warrant officer? What is that? Well, when you graduate from flight school as a warrant officer, um, you're, you're W1, W01, Warrant Officer First Class. Um, your next promotion is to Chief Warrant Officer, which is a, like going from Second Lieutenant to First Lieutenant. You become a CW2 and then you three, four, and now the Army has CW5s. Um, an aircraft commander is responsible for the aircraft, for the crew, for the machine. He's the person in charge of that aircraft. Um, and he makes the final decisions when they have to be made. And that goes, you become an aircraft commander based on, uh, the unit I was in, was based on your, how many hours you'd flown and your ability not only to fly, but your judgment, your, the common sense you used. Um, how you reacted in situations. Because when you were a, um, a pilot or a co-pilot, um, you were constantly being evaluated by the aircraft commander. And they would talk amongst themselves. You know, this guy did this, this guy does that, this guy needs work there. And as you flew with the different aircraft commanders, um, when you were new, you picked up something from each one of them because each one of them had a slightly different expertise. Each one of them um, had a different way of showing you things. Some of them were good instructors. Some of them, and I'm using that term loosely um, as instructors, some of them you just learn by observing. Uh, they didn't teach. They just, you know, you watched, you learned, you mimicked uh, what they were doing. And you picked up, and you developed your own style from everything you picked up. And when you became an aircraft commander and started working with the new pilots, you would impart that information and they again would assimilate from all the different aircraft commanders. But a lot of it was based on um, your ability to handle situations and the judgment you showed and, and how you reacted to things. Just take me into some of the more difficult tasks you had as a pilot over there and, 
any combat you got into, what you experienced, and what 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 was the end result? It's uh, it's hard to sum up a year. Um, we did so many different things. Um, the way our air cavalry unit worked is, like I said, we were assigned to a Vietnamese unit for the day, and we would fly from our home airfield of Vinh Long out to wherever that unit was. We could be staged at um, an auxiliary f airfield. They had those throughout the Delta. We could be working out of a field next to a village. We could be working out of a field next to where the unit was encamped. It, so it all depended on what was going on, and it depended on what happened. Um, give you an example. My first day of flying, um, I had been checked out in the aircraft, been signed off by the instructor pilot in the unit as okay to fly. He gave me a local area, orient, local area orientation. And a day or so later, I'm on a schedule board to fly, and uh, we had an easy mission that day. We were supposed to fly some demonstrations for some visiting Chinese generals. Um, in the middle of, of what we were doing, we got a call, a Navy helicopter had crashed, and we needed to go and secure the crash site. So we fly over to where the crash site was. We picked up um, some Arvin troops with their American advisors and put them in around the crash site to protect it. Um, as we're sitting there, our crew chief comes up and says to the aircraft commander, um, we're not going anywhere. There was a part on the rotor head that uh, needed to be replaced and it broken. So we weren't going anywhere. Maintenance finally got out to us after dark. Um, and while waiting for them, the lieutenant that was in, the advisor to the Vietnamese had come up and said, well, you know, you may want to go into these ditches over there because it's getting dark and here's mosquito repellent. And I'm looking around and I had my 38 on my hip and that was the only weapon I had. And uh, I'm saying, you know, this is not good. Um, maintenance came out, dropped off the part and left. So there we are uh, in the dark, standing on top of a Huey which puts us about 12 feet off the ground with flashlights uh, so you can be seen for a great distance um, while the crew chief replaced the part. We then flew back to the airfield, um, shut the aircraft down, turned everything in, the pilots turned in. I went to my room and I don't think it was more than an hour or two later, I hear this noise outside, I don't know what it is. The, the uh, aircraft commander I had been flying with came into the room and said, get dressed. He said, we're being mortared. We're the only crew that hasn't been drinking. They had had a party that night, which we missed because we were stuck out waiting for the part. We're now on five-minute alert. So I got dressed. We drove down to the airfield. We were on five-minute alert for about two hours. They finally released us. I went back to the room. A couple hours later, I got up and flew the next day. And I'm just saying to myself, this is going to be a long year <laughs> if this keeps up. Um, is it exciting though, flying? Uh, to me, it'd be exciting, or does it become just like another job routine, or is there an adrenaline rush to what you do? Sometimes it was routine if you're flying from point A to point B, um, and it would take an hour, hour and a half to do that flight. You're, you're up at a couple of thousand feet above the ground, um, which is where we flew. Um, it's like, you know, you're sitting back, you're, you're listening to the radio, uh, we always had one of the aircraft radios tuned to Armed Forces Network Radio. So is it like the movies? You're listening to the doors or creeping through oh, yeah. the water and you're going... Wah, 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 wah. Oh yeah. Um, you had four different radios that you were listening to at all times. Um, we would turn off Armed Forces Vietnam. We would turn off the, the, radio, the music um, when we had to concentrate on the other radios. But other than that, I always had it tuned in and I was listening to... Um, Creed of Clearwater or The Doors or The Beatles, The Stones, whatever they were playing because it was you know, contemporary rock music at the time. So was it your typical 60s scene of the Huey and the music and, 
and the heat and I mean it, kind it, of. You know, Hollywood tries to portray. Ho- Hollywood, you know, they they portray a little bit. They magnify it, but it was kind of like that. Um, did you see We Were Soldiers? I saw it. I read the book and I've seen the movie. And how did you feel watching that movie? I thought it was pretty realistic. Um, I thought they did a very good job in um, transferring that book to the screen. Um, it's um, and, and this has been said many, many times before. You know, it's hours of boredom followed by minutes of sheer terror, and it can be like that. Um, the first time, I think it was my first day when we were doing the demonstration for the Chinese generals. Um, the Cobras were putting uh, suppressing fire as we made the mock combat assault. I didn't know what to expect, and all of a sudden I hear their rockets going off next to us, and it almost jumped out of my skin because I didn't know what it was. Um, the first time we took fire going into an LZ, um, it was just mind-numbing, like somebody's shooting at me, you know, this is for real. Um, you develop, I don't think you ever get used to it, but you develop a sense that, you know, I'm being shot at. You know, you, you, it's just part of what goes on. Is there fear at those times? Is there thoughts of, oh, I want to get home someday? Or I mean, are you conscious of fighting for God and country? Or is it survival? Or is it just, what, what keeps you focused? I mean, The people you're with is what keeps you focused. Um, the longer you're there, the less you think about home. Um, you, you put it aside. You, you compartmentalize it. Um, you, you put that aside because you can't think about that when you're doing a combat assault. You have to concentrate on what's going on around you. You have to concentrate because, you're, first of all, you're flying formation with other aircraft. And we used to fly a very tight formation. Um, you had to concentrate on the aircraft you were flying off of because if you let your mind wander, you could have an accident in a heartbeat. So your, your total focus when you were flying formation was on the aircraft you were flying off of. If he, if he messed up, you caught the consequences for it, and the person next to you or behind you, farther down the formation, got the repercussions also. It was a ripple effect. But you're going into Z, people are shooting at you, um, rockets are going off, mortars may be going off, off around you on the ground. You're just concentrating on, on the aircraft in front of you or next to you, getting down, getting the troops off, and getting out, um, all, up, all at the same time. And uh, the adrenaline does pump, but all you're thinking about is what's going on around you. And the longer you stayed, the longer I stayed there, and I think this is true for others as well, um, when you got back to your, the airfield at night, when we got back to our rooms, um, that's when you thought about home, family. Um, you might write a letter, you might read a letter, uh, but once you're out, it was all business. And you were there because of the people around you. You wanted to survive, you wanted them to survive, um, you wanted to go home. Do you ever feel lonely or detached from the real world back home or, and like nobody understands what's going on and, and, and ever have thoughts like that or was it just the camaraderie sustained you through all that? It was the camaraderie that sustained you. We were kind of isolated from the real world, um, being in four core, being that it was um, the Vietnamization started there and Nixon had declared that the Delta was pacified. Um, which was a big joke to us that were down there. But um, we didn't get as much of the news as others may. Some people had TVs. They would watch the news on Armed Forces Network. Once in a while, we would get a Stars and Stripes newspaper to read. But um, you were very detached from what went on in the world. You knew a little bit about what went on. Um, we were one of the first units to go into Cambodia in 1970. Um, we were there the first day. Um, we thought it was great. I mean, when the unit commander called us together the night before and told us we were going the next day, everybody was cheering. Um, we didn't know, I didn't know what happened in Kent State till weeks afterwards. Um, and I just looked at what went on there and just shook my head and saying, what's wrong with them? 
you know, the protesters. When I went in r and R, I'd been in country about nine months. I went to Hawaii. Um, it was surreal in some ways. Um, leaving Vietnam and a day later being in Hawaii. Um, when I left Hawaii and went back, I didn't want to fly anymore. And I said, no, nah, I've done, well, excuse me, seven months, not my nine months. I had done seven months and I had tasted the world again, as we used to call it, and I just didn't want to fly. And I had an ear infection, so I didn't fly for a couple days when I first got back until the flight surgeon cleared me. Um, but then after a day or two back flying, it was right back into the, the routine again. And well, why didn't you want to fly? What happened? Um, I saw life. I saw what, you know, what life is about again. Um, I was away from what was going on in Vietnam. I was back in real world with people, um, civilians, I should say, um, eating and drinking and, and laying on the beach and just having a good time. And um, I just, you know, I didn't want to go back and fly because I didn't know. I had tasted life again. I didn't want to lose it. But it just took a couple of days, and that was compartmentalized again. They gave you R and R in the middle of your tour. Is that what they do with everybody? They had a policy then. You got a week's free R and R, rest and relaxation, um, and they had R and R centers in different parts of the world. Just the aviation units. Anybody. And troops too. Anybody was eligible for that, and that was a free one. You could also put in for a week's leave, which came off your thirty day leave that you earned every year, um, and if the unit could have could um, afford you to go, they would give you the leave. The big difference is R&R, &R, you were guaranteed a flight on that day to wherever you were going. Leave was on standby. So the way it worked is the married guys usually went to Hawaii, brought the family out to Hawaii. Uh, the single guys would go to Australia, Bangkok, um, Taiwan. Um, I think those are the R&R &R centers out of country. Um, tell me about the most difficult thing maybe that you had to do during your tour or the, or the worst thing that you saw. Uh, probably the most difficult thing was getting accustomed to flying day after day, um, every day. When I got there, we had enough pilots to meet the daily mission. So you couldn't get a day off. Um, the first day off was almost a month after I started flying, and the only reason I had it off is I flew the day mission, I flew the night mission, and they had to give me the day off. Um, and it was just, I think the hardest part was just getting into, physically, getting into that routine. Um, after a while, it, it just became an everyday experience. Um, you didn't realize how fatigued you might be. Um, you just got up and did your job. Um, the worst thing I saw, it, it's hard to say. Um, you, you become an, um, isolated or, or hardened to seeing things. So, I mean, when you see half bodies and things like that, um, it's part of the job, part of the day. So it, it's, it's difficult to say. Um, I mean, were you, when you saw stuff like that, were you flying? Were they in the helicopter? Were, were you on the ground? What, what were the casualties and stuff? We, one, day, one day we were uh, told to go out into this wilderness area along the Cambodian border. A Vietnamese patrol had disappeared overnight. And nobody quite knew where they were. They knew the general area. They said they were wearing tiger suits, which is a type of uh, camouflage uniform. And uh, we said, no, you know, we don't know who we're picking up. We, you know, we need a little bit more than that. Finally, they came back and said, we found what's left of them. They had been ambushed and wiped out. So I was sent out with, with, uh, to pick up the remains. And um, it was remains. It was half bodies. It was uh, body parts. And uh, they just loaded them in the aircraft. And um, we flew them back to um, a stage, an auxiliary field, a stage field, 
um, so they could be picked up by the Vietnamese medical people and taken to their morgue or wherever they went. Um, that was that was pretty bad. Um, watching them bring the pieces and, and the half bodies. Um, my aircraft had no doors on it. It, it wasn't a pretty aircraft, um, but it was a good one to fly. But it had no doors on it, and um, that day we wound up with bits and pieces on the inside of the windscreen, on the back of the pilot's helmets. Um, if you know what a, an H model Huey, how it sits, it sits tail low, nose high. And when we landed, the crew chief said there was uh, an inch or two of blood and uh, body fluids built up in the back of the aircraft. So before we went anywhere, we, we had to wash it out. There was a, a lake there. We just took buckets of water and washed everything out. And um, then we went right back and started carrying troops again. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was one of, I guess, one of the worst sights. Um, on the other hand, one day we were watching dolphins in the South China Sea, and we saw a couple. I saw a couple of water spouts. I'd never seen those before. We were watching those from a distance, um, and of course, there were some parts down there that were absolutely beautiful to fly over. Um, so it was a mixture, and it could happen in the same day. You could be working out of a, an idyllic spot along a coastline and then fly into um, a hot LZ with everything coming at you. Well, just one more time, just into a hot LZ, are you hearing the ping-pings? Are you, are you re I mean, is your ship getting hit by some of this? And are you have door gunners in there shooting away? We have door gunners, uh, the crew chief on one side and the, the door gunner on the other, uh, and they would be shooting their, their machine guns. Um, I was lucky. Um, my aircraft, any aircraft I flew, I only took hits once in a year. And that was, um, I don't know how it happened, it was just luck. And the day we took the hits, it was into the seats, the pilot, the co-pilot seats took rounds. Um, everything else, I think, went in one side, cargo door that was open and went out the other side. Um, other people um, did take hits, and depending on the size of the of uh, what was hitting you would, would de make determine what the, it sounded like from what I was told. Did other, any other aircraft get shot or shot down in any of your missions that you were around you or you guys were had out pretty good? No, we had aircraft that were, were hit. We had some that were shot down. Uh, we had some that went, would go down for maintenance purposes. Uh, a hydraulic line would, would break, um, transmission line would break, and uh, the aircraft would sit there until it could be repaired. Um, we had scout aircraft were shot down. My unit was was pretty lucky. Um, we lost one Huey pilot the year I was there. That was my first roommate. He was killed, or my second roommate. He was killed. Um, I think we lost a scout observer. Was killed. Um, we had some people injured and were shipped home. Uh, scout pilots and gun pilots. We had a couple gunships shot down, uh, the Cobras. But overall, um, we didn't sustain the personnel casualties that other units did. We didn't sustain at our airfield. We didn't sustain uh, aircraft casualties that other units did. I think part of it was the tactics my unit flew. Um, part of it might have been the training or that I received from the more experienced pilots who that was then passed on to the new pilots by my peer, people that came in about the time I did. Um, but we flew different tactics than the other cavalry, air cavalry units at our airfield. Were you with the first air cavalry or was there assignment there? It was just the 160th you said? Or? Well, it was the 164th Combat Aviation Group was the Delta. We were part of the 1st Aviation Brigade, which was that overall umbrella for, uh, on a for aviation units that weren't part of an army division. Okay. My actual unit was uh, D Troop 3rd of the 5th Cavalry, 3rd Squadron 5th Cavalry. 5th Cavalry. It had been part, they had been part of the 9th Division when the 9th Division was rotated home in 69. 
late 69. They took uh, the air troop that I was in, D troop, and left that in the Delta. They took the ground troops, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, they sent them up near the DMZ in, in North Vietnam, in northern part of Vietnam. Have, have you, you mentioned losing some people, have you ever been to the wall in, in Washington, D.C.? Several times. Can you tell me the first time you went, why you went, and what you experienced there? Um, I went to see what it was, to pay my respects to some people that uh, I knew. Um, very emotional. Um, Walk in there, isn't it? What do you think it's the way it's built, or just the thought of all those names, or what, what do you think hits you when you go there? The people I know, um, just the feeling you get there. It um, is powerful. And I've been there a couple times since, and it's still pretty powerful. You're from New Jersey, you said? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna go back there in Bal I'm gonna go back to Baltimore next month and I'm actually having three of the Vietnam veterans I've interviewed meet me we're all going together to the wall. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna I'm gonna walk in with each of them and at one at a time and just kinda of get their thoughts because I, I want that to be the ending of my film. So. Okay. So uh, thank you for what you shared there. Um, no problem. New Jersey has a memorial also. Do they? Yeah. And it's it's interesting also. Theirs is um circular, and they have uh, 366 panels, one for each day of the year, and on each panel is inscribed the name of the New Jersey person that died on that day. So when you walk, you walk in, you're just surrounded by it. It's, it's very fitting, and they have an education center right there also. What part of New Jersey is that? That's um, kind of central Jersey near the coast. It's down around uh, the Garden State Arts Center. It's right there, right off the parkway. It sits on a bluff. Uh, they did a nice job with it. Um, I have, I think, three or four classmates of mine from high school that are there. Their names are on the wall in New Jersey as well as naturally in Washington. Tom, as we get towards the end of this interview, tell me, as, as a Vietnam veteran and even as an American citizen, what does freedom mean to you and what does that mean, mean to your life, freedom? Oof, freedom. Um, to me, freedom is basically the ability to think, the ability to speak out your opinions, your, your feelings, the ability to do what you can make of yourself. Um, you're, you're not programmed that you're, you're going to be a truck driver. You, know, you could be the next Einstein, but you know, you're programmed to be a truck driver and that's all you're ever going to be. I mean, the freedom is you make of yourself what you can, you think, uh, you express, um, but it comes with responsibilities, and the responsibilities are very heavy. And one of them is you have to protect that freedom. Um, today's military is doing that. Um, they're not, the way things are going as of right now, um, it looks like they're not going to be getting the support that they need from our leaders. Um, and sitting back and looking at it, it's, it's purely political on the part of the leaders. Um, Is it reminiscent of Vietnam, anything? Today? In some ways. Yeah. In some ways. I mean, I look back, I look at what's happening now with the, the resolutions that, that they're trying to pass in Washington and um, how they want to cut funding and, and whatever. And it goes back to the, the, seven, the early 70s when they started doing that with Vietnam. They started cutting back the funding. Um, you don't have the funding, you have to pull troops out. You can't supply, well in that case you can't supply the Vietnamese with material that they need. Um, so there are some 
similarities in my mind, and if it, if it keeps going, um, it, it'll probably wind up the same way. Um, I told my wife when we went into Iraq that the American people don't have the intestinal fortitude to see it through. Um, everybody now wants it to be quick, flashy, and over with. And when you go into something like this, and this is before it became you know, the civil conflict that it is now with the two sides killing each other, with us in the middle. Um, but when you go into a conflict like that, um, the only way you can, you can wipe out terrorism is slowly and methodically. And the American public does not, and it hasn't for years, I mean it didn't have it in Korea, didn't have it in Vietnam, doesn't have it now. They don't have the mentality of staying there for five, ten years, if that's what it takes. And part of it right now is the media um, brings home nothing but the bad side. Um, they don't show the good that's being done. And uh, there's a lot of good that's being done. I have friends that are still connected with the military that get information about what's going on in Iraq. You'll never see it on the evening news. Uh, I've been approached by some people about doing some work with the, the people coming back and then interviewing them and even have had calls from Marines in Iraq. So mm -hmm. that's something I'm, they said the same thing. They're not telling the good, so. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, let me ask you this question, kind of a follow-up to the freedom question. Obviously, freedom's not free. Um, what does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? It's a symbol of what our country's about. Um, it's a symbol of the sacrifice and the hope that America's about. And it's uh, something to be respected. Uh, even though it's a, it's a symbol, but you respect that symbol because that shows you respect your country. Um, a lot of people have died for that flag. Um, people are still dying for that flag. And um, I hate to say it, but it seems in, to a degree that um, it's becoming almost passe that people, you know, they're just in it for themselves. They they don't have that love of country that was passed down in the past from generation to generation. That For every privilege there is a sacrifice. For every freedom that you have to work to keep it. And a lot of people today just expect you know, that they're entitled to it and uh, it doesn't work that way. And that's hard to convey to somebody who's was born in a free country, I mean, mm -hmm. with, like the younger kids today, and that's why I spent a lot of my time trying to go into schools, mm -hmm. want to come back here like we talked about, and, and it's, it's an eye-opener for these younger kids. Wow, you know, that happened, and that, that's why we have what we have. They don't even give it a second thought, so, but it was good, good response there. Thank you for that. Um, are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? Yes. I mean, I did, I um, essentially volunteered because I wanted to be a helicopter pilot. Um, I saw when I got there that things were a little different than I thought they would be. Um, I saw how the mismanagement by senior officials in the, in, in the White House and in, in the uh, cabinet um, kept America from possibly defeating the communists in a military sense and having, whether it be two separate viable countries now or just one free um, country. Um, so in a sense, you know, we wasted lives because we weren't allowed to do what we were capable of doing. Um, I don't regret going. Um, I'm sorry for friends that I lost. Um, but I, I, I felt that there was a reason to be there. We just weren't able to achieve what we could have because of the way we were hamstrung. But I wouldn't trade. I have very, very good friends that I met over there that I'm still in touch with today. And uh, 
as Tom Hanks made popular with his Brotherhood of War series. Um, it's true. People you serve in combat, in the military, but especially people you serve in combat with, uh, there's a bond there that will never be shared elsewhere. And that bond will be there till, till you die. And you are brothers. Have people thanked you for your service? Not really. I mean, uh, family was happy I came home, family and friends. Did you have a homecoming? Was it a, a horror scene like I hear, or was it just, you know? It was quiet. I mean, yeah. I, I took a troop flight into uh, McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, and you were on your own after that. Um, you know, I caught a flight to Florida, where my family was at the time. Um, I was just somebody in uniform. That was all. Um, you could tell who was in the military from the way you dressed and your haircut. And um, you just avoided certain... And I was down south, I mean, I was still in the Army. Uh, my next duty station was Fort Jackson, South Carolina. So, I mean, I wasn't in California or any of the hotbeds of, of what went on. But even in South Carolina, um, you just avoided going certain places, avoided getting involved in certain things. Because you stood out. You just didn't want any confrontations if you could avoid them. One more question. Mm -hmm. um, what should people remember about Vietnam? We did what we were asked to do. Um, and it, the Vietnam veteran is not the deranged drug addicted homeless person that everybody associates with. There are veterans like that. Um, maybe because of Vietnam service, maybe they just had a predilection to developing that way. Um, but we were asked to do a job and we did the job as best as they would allow us to do. And uh, I think most of us um, are proud of what we did. Perfect. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing sure. that I've asked all the veterans from day one at the end of my interview. I always like you to look into the camera and give me a salute. Can you do that when I tell you? Okay. From where you're seated right there, for the camera sec here. Have a salute for a while. <laughs> I'm sure you can do it. Okay, Tom, right in the camera. Great, thank you.